We knew that Powell was going to pivot. The only question was when he would do it and how he would, you know, describe it. And, you know, of course, the pivot is not because the Fed has won the inflation war. I mean, the Fed has already lost that war. Uh, the, the reason that the Fed is pivoting is to avoid a financial crisis and to help reelect Joe Biden. Uh, because the impact of rising rates was starting to weigh very heavily on the real economy. Certainly the housing market was affected dramatically by the increase in rates, but businesses were now dealing with rising rates. We had the beginning of what would have been a major financial crisis last year as banks were you know, seeing a collapse in the value of their collateral, of their assets, which was something that I predicted for years. You know, when mortgage interest rates were down at, you know, 3% and, you know, the U.S. government was issuing long-term treasuries for, you know, 1% or, you know, five-year treasuries for 25 basis points, whatever it was. And everybody was talking about how great this was because the government could borrow all this money cheap and homeowners were able to borrow all this money and, and refinance their mortgages and lock in this rates. And everybody was touting how great this was was for the borrowers. I was the only one who was out there pointing out how bad it was going to be for the lenders, that the lenders were going to be trapped owning these low yielding assets once interest rates eventually went up. And that's exactly what happened. The banks are now in trouble for the very reason that I predicted they would be. They loaded up on these long-term mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, U.S. treasuries, and they're now worth 70 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, and they're going to be worth a lot less when interest rates resume their ascent, which eventually they will. But in the meantime, in March of last year, the Federal Reserve came to the rescue of all these banks uh, and put a Band-Aid on a, a cancer that has only gotten worse since they did that. And we're going going to find out how much worse, uh, I guess, in a couple more months when that uh, temporary, uh, you know, a program uh, expires and the Fed, of course, is going to have to roll it over. If you look at the rate with which the national debt is growing, I mean, even though the official budget deficits are not quite two trillion a year, if you look at the rate at which the national debt is increasing, and all you have to do is go to you know the, the national debt clock on, on the internet, and you'll see that we're adding about a trillion dollars of debt every quarter. Uh, so the national debt is growing by about four trillion a year, and we're not even technically in a recession yet. I mean, we probably are in a recession if you measure the numbers correctly, uh, but the way the government has everything rigged, we're not in one. But eventually we will be, and historically, when we do go into a recession, whatever the deficits were prior to the recession, a swell. I mean, they double or triple. And that's hard to believe that could happen given how large they are right now. You know, it's when the economy is doing well and they keep telling us the economy is great. That's when you're supposed to have surpluses, <laughs> you know, to pay off the deficits. Now, we never have those, but at least in the past, when the economy was good, the deficits were smaller, you know, <laughs> and then they got larger when we went into recession. But but now we have the largest deficits in our history and we're told you know we're not even in a recession that the economy is doing well so there's all this uh, you know debt on the market meanwhile who's buying it the, the federal reserve which was the largest buyer of treasuries the federal reserve is selling in competition with the treasury also the social security so-called trust funds which used to be buyers of u.s treasuries not that many years ago because social security had a surplus they would collect taxes payroll taxes and then pay out benefits and there was some money left over and what the social security trust funds did with that money is they bought treasuries well now given you know how weak the economy is how many people have left the labor force uh, there's a net deficit. So security, despite all these jobs that are out there, people have two or three jobs now, they're not paying enough payroll tax to cover the baby boom in retirement. So the Social Security trust funds are already selling U.S. Treasuries. So they've gone from buyers to sellers, just like the Federal Reserve. The other big buyers of Treasuries were the Bank of China, Bank of Japan. They're not buying anymore. Uh, so who's buying all these Treasuries? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know anybody who wants to buy them, really. So there's a huge problem. And that's why I believe that the Fed is going to go back to quantitative easing before the end of this year. I 
I just don't see how we're going to make it through the entire year if the Fed continues to sell at treasuries, especially if the dollar starts to fall, which I believe it will. I think that the, the main reason that the Fed succeeded in bringing down the uh, official inflation measures, the CPI headline number, was the strength of the dollar. The dollar had a huge run uh, in anticipation of all of the rate hikes uh, that would be you know, implemented to try to bring down the inflation rate. And I think it was the strength of the dollar. And the dollar index went up from about 90-ish to 115. And I think it was that dollar strength that brought down oil prices, commodity prices, and helped bring that pressure uh, on the headline numbers. Well, the dollar has already backed off from 115. Now it's around 102, 102 and a half. Uh, but I think that we're going to fall substantially uh, probably throughout uh, you know, 2024. And that is going to reverse that progress. And I think right now where we are on the CPI, where we're in the low threes, that's really the trough. And I think you know, sometime during this year, we're going to start to see the year over year inflation numbers headed back up. And so we never quite made it down to 2%. And now we're, we're headed back up. But I don't believe that that's going to derail the return to quantitative easing, because I think the Fed is going to have to decide that higher inflation is better than the alternative. Because if the Fed does, you know, pull the rug out from under the markets and, you know, cancel the rate hikes that everybody has factored in and continues to raise rates, and continues with quantitative tightening, the whole market's going to implode. The stock market would crash, real estate, the whole fiscal situation, the banking sector, we could have a worse financial crisis than 2008, and all this during an election year. And I don't think that Jerome Powell is going to let his boss have to run for re-election in that type of environment. And I think for all the talk, you know, the Biden administration wants to pretend that the Fed is independent. It's not independent at all. I mean, they're, they're talking to Powell, and Powell's got his, his script, his marching orders, and I think he's going to follow it. People just assume that the Treasury won't default because they've got a printing press. But that doesn't mean that owning Treasuries is safe because if the government has to create inflation to pay off the debt, the debt's not really paid off. It's repudiated. You don't get your purchasing power back. And we, we've already crossed that point where the debt is payable. It's, it's not payable through legitimate means. The U.S. government cannot tax the American public to a degree that would allow it to honestly repay its debt. And it can't cut spending in other areas. The U.S. government is not going to cut Social Security so it can pay interest on the national debt. It's just never going to happen. In fact, whenever we get to the debt ceiling and they talk about, you know, what's going to happen if we don't raise the ceiling, the first thing they say is, well, we're going to have to default on our debt. They never say, well, we're going to have to raise taxes to collect more income so we can pay our debts, or we're going to have to cut Social Security so we can pay our debts. The government tells us right up front, if we can't borrow more money, we're defaulting on the, the money we've already borrowed. I mean, it, they, they admit it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, so the only way to avoid default is to inflate. But there is no viable way to honestly repay what's been borrowed because we've borrowed way too much. You, the government can't do it. In fact, if you look at the, the nature of the debt in the next year, just the next year, about a third of the national debt matures, which is over $10 trillion. And when you figure the new money we have to borrow over the next year, the U.S. government has to finance about $15 trillion of debt. Well, who, who wants to loan us $15 trillion? You know, now a lot of that debt is the debt that's maturing. But the people who own that debt may not want to roll it over. They may want their money back so that they could do something else with it. You know, that's what happened with a lot of the banks. That's why one of the reasons the banks were in so much trouble and needed these bailouts is their depositors wanted their money back because they had better places to put it. Like they could just put it in a money market and earn 5% loaning it to the U.S. government. The banks were paying nothing. And so the customers wanted their money back, but the banks didn't have it because they loaned it to the government themselves you know, for 10 years, you know, at 1%.
or they loaned out a 30 year mortgage at 3% and they didn't have the cash. So, you know, the US Treasury is in, in the same position. Uh, so, in order to prevent all of this, you know, they're just going to print money. And again, that's not a get out of jail free card. You know, and I hear people say, well, you don't have to worry about the governments that borrow in their own currency because they're never going to default. Well, you know, yeah, but Argentina borrowed in pesos. Although maybe I shouldn't use Argentina as an example now. They're, they're back on, maybe they're on the right track. But in the past, they, they made all these mistakes or Zimbabwe or there are a lot of countries that had hyperinflation. They were making up this transitory nonsense in order to avoid raising rates. In fact, if you remember uh, back in 2021, when inflation, the way they measure it, right, first moved above 2%, instead of raising rates, they decided to reinvent their mandate. And they said, you know, we're targeting average inflation now. We, we don't just want inflation at 2%. We want a historically average rate of 2%. So Powell said, we need to make up for the fact that we had a few years below 2%. Now we need to let it run above 2% for a little while just to kind of average it all up, which was a bunch of nonsense in the first place. But Powell I was just looking for an excuse not to do anything about the inflation problem because he was afraid of what it might do to the real economy. So they made up this, you know, this BS about inflation averaging. Yeah, nobody asked Powell about inflation averaging now because look how much higher than 2% inflation has been. And even the Fed will admit that it's not going back down to 2% until maybe 2025 or 2026. So how much lower than 2% is inflation going to have to run to bring the average back down to 2%? when right now the average is so much higher than 2%. So that, that inflation averaging went out the window, right? <laughs> nobody, nobody talks about it. It's like, you know, it, you're not allowed to mention it. But that that is the last official policy. They never, they never officially abandoned that and said, you know what? Forget about inflation averaging. All we want to do is get back down to 2%. We don't care if it averages 5 or 6 or 7%, you know, along the way. <laughs> we just want to get back to 2%, you know, because... If that's the case, if you only have to average down low inflation, but you never have to average down high inflation, right? In the long run, inflation is going to be much, much higher than 2%. You know, and that's what the gold market still hasn't repriced. Gold is still reflecting the belief that the Fed's going to succeed and that over the long run, inflation is going to average 2%. It's not. It's going to average much higher than that, probably average closer to 20% than 2%. And when the market has to price in gold, a present value of gold, given a much, much higher future inflation rate, then gold needs to be replaced, priced much higher, and, and it will be.